So we're gonna got about an hour here to spend together. And my topic is on mentorship and um, how to um, get the next generation of, of biomeds into the field. But before I start, I wanna sort of poll the audience as to why you're here. What do you wanna get out of this session in the next hour? Let's see how somebody else does it, how they suggest others do it. Okay, so you've got a mentorship program, okay. Anyone else? I'm new to the field, so I want to know how to help Ah, okay, so you're coming in from the other side rather than offering a mentorship. You want to seek a mentorship look and position. Is that correct? Anyone else? I'd like to know how we can get shop back into the high school. So we, that's where I learned electronics 45 years ago. Okay. That's what we got to do is get it back in high school, show them what our industry is all about. Funny you should say that uh, Amy has a program that is flexible and can be brought into schools on trying to get interest. And I, I brought some flyers. I don't have enough to, to share them, but I can put them out uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first slide is our new hospital. Um, this is a med center that opened about two years ago, and it literally doubled the size of our facility. And uh, partly because we're going to single patient rooms uh, for privacy, uh, HIPAA, as well as nosocomial infections, uh, hospital-inquired infections. If you don't have somebody on the other side of the curtain who's hacking and coughing, it's probably better. Okay, so our objective for today is why it makes sense to have a mentorship program and uh, to create the next generation of professionals in our field. Um, some ideas on how to get started uh, on doing a mentorship program, what the benefits are of trained versus, uh, you know, you'll learn it on the job uh, tutoring and uh, the concept of a formal career growth ladder, which is not exactly mentorship, but it, it's a dovetailed topic. And then uh, setting goals and objectives as you uh, try and implement your milestones, metrics, and then the ever popular topic of certification. So, we're gonna try and look at creating opportunities for internships through shadowing senior staff and academic short courses. Um, you can pursue a formal degree program. These take a little longer, they're a little more expensive, but they knock down barriers in terms of job growth and promotion. And all in all, employee benefits of being satisfied and increasing productivity. If you have someone who is happy to come to work, uh, they will stay with you, treat them well, compensation as well as the intangible parts of you know, making it family uh, goes a long way to retaining your, your employees. Um, be aware that they will leave you. Uh, sometimes for a for more money, sometimes for different opportunities or growth, um, or to explore something that's refreshing and different. So let's let's talk about creating opportunities and this this concept of um, shadowing your your senior staff, the ones that already know what to do and have the opportunity to show less experienced staff, you know, follow me, this is the path, let me guide you. So academic pursuits, uh, I'm a big fan of getting a degree. If you don't have a college degree, it's never too late. Um, there's also community college opportunities, although in specifically in the field, they're much reduced. Uh, we can talk about that'll come up in the next couple slides. Um, short courses, you know, this could be um, employer, um, you know, sponsored training 
to get a certificate to work on advanced equipment in the operating room, uh, ventilators, anesthesia machines, um, cardiac bypass, you know, whatever it is, uh, typically you need to have advanced training and a certificate to work on it. Certification, um, Amy has a half a dozen different subspecialties. Uh, we can talk about that. Or I'm, I'm a certified clinical engineer. So um, differentiated uh, class in terms of education and um, expected expertise. But these are all uh, driving towards employee satisfaction and productivity. Any questions so far? How would you mirror an internship program to the apprenticeship program? Great question. Uh, the comparison between apprenticeship and internship, they're very different. Um, there are some overlaps. The idea, again, is to take a less experienced, more junior person and move them up in terms of responsibility and job assignments. But an internship um, is, is different. The, the apprenticeship program is basically getting paid whereas the internship or mentorship may not be. And the mentorship could also be external, bringing in high school students or uh, community college students, giving them on-premises, hands-on experience. Um, that's you know basically someone who has more advanced skills showing someone who is coming up. Yeah, in Portland, the Portland Community College had a program for five months. And um, they we did an internship program where their students would go to all the hospitals around the Portland area. And they also had one that came out was before COVID, because COVID the hospital shut the whole thing down. What I got the college professor to do was use the same test equipment that we used. So when he had graduates and I needed somebody, I could hire somebody that knew how to do a safety check on the same equipment I had. Brilliant. <laughs> So I'll, let me repeat that. This is um, an opportunity to customize the training in a way that you're using the equipment that would be expected for a entry level biomed and they come in and they hit the ground running. Talk to your colleagues. Okay, good, good suggestion. All right, so a little bit of a history lesson as to where the term mentorship comes from. This goes back to the Trojan War and uh, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, where Homer went off to war and was gone for 10 years and entrusted his son into the care of a senior citizen who was his instructor and protector and his guide. So let me take a quick show of hands. Have you or your organization developed a mentoring program to achieve employee growth and development? Show of hands. Anybody who's doing this? So about four or five of us in the room, and there's about 30, 35 here. So how do you go ahead and create this? How do you empower your employees as well as your senior staff that has to sign off on it. How to actually do the program on, you know, what's the content? What are the takeaways or the skills that you expect them to acquire during this training period? And how do you enable them to, to move forward? And then if it didn't document it, it never happened. This way, if you uh, take notes and say, this is what we were doing before we had the program, and this is what happened as a result, you know, it's easier to sell um, to your senior management and get funding and you know, do it again next year. So if you wanna continue. So here's the problem that I'm seeing is that we have a serious shortage of experienced DMETs as applicants. The training programs are drying up and going away. I would say from five years ago, we have maybe 50% of the 
formal training programs. And I did this earlier in my career where I was a professor and was teaching biomed. Um, a lot of those schools have closed for a variety of reasons. COVID has not been kind to the educational system. Um, and yet the demand for HTM, health tech, technology professionals and biomeds um, is going to just continue to increase. Um, at, at our institution, um, we're adding, we, we had an on-call uh, program in the evenings. We're now going to 24 seven coverage. So we're gonna need more people for that. We're talking about expanding our deliverables to include uh, laboratory and imaging, which have been uh, outsourced for, for a long time. We're gonna need more bodies, more you know, people in the department coming forward. And they need to have the differentiated certificates training and ability to, to handle those particular areas. So for me, it's a very real uh, need. And I think uh, everyone here in the room, I'm getting a lot of head nods. We need more people. And the military's not even meeting their minimum. We'll come back to that in a moment because the military is a rich source of hiring candidates because they've been trained. They're, they tend to have a personality profile of, I just want to get the job done and teach me what to do and I will learn it and master it. And but so- They're not even getting their minimum recruits. They're not even getting the minimum recruits. The military is not, but the biomed program is still going strong. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good to know. All right. So why does this make sense to have a mentorship program? Well, the resources are hard to find. And let me go through sort of a scenario of um, you had a technician who either retired or left to take another position. And now there's a gap in your, you know, coverage. The first thing you have to do is seek approval for funding for a expansion or replacement position. You then have to go through and figure out if the off the shelf job description is accurate or if this is a customized role that has specific duties and responsibilities. Then you have to go out and advertise or recruit or use a, a placement agency to bring in candidates. You have to go through a screening process. You bring them in for an interview and some people have the right stuff and the right personality um, and others don't. And by the way, to eliminate them at this point is always painful, but it's easier than doing it later. Okay, then there's the whole job offer, acceptance, formal hiring, and then you get into the onboarding. And so now you have a new, new person who shows up, doesn't know where the lunchroom is, you know, the culture of how you do PMs and documentation is all something that's learned. Resources, where are the manuals kept, if, even if they're electronic or online, where's your policies, what do you need to know about um, what's inbounds or what's out of bounds for, for the job. And then there's uh, that training um, period. Um, there's a formal, you know, um, provisionary period typically, um, orientation and typically six months, maybe, you know, if you're lucky it's six months, it could be a year before you have a fully trained, competent, independent worker. So this idea of a functional employee takes a while. So here's a small group activity. For the next five minutes or so, we'll take a break out, break out in groups of four or five. You can pick people that are sitting close to where you are. And if you have trouble, I will assign you. And discuss the availability of new hire candidates and the impact on service and operations. This is the topic that is driving the mentorship program. So go ahead and separate out in, in groups of four or five. Yes. 
so 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 that's really that there's been good fighting Why don't we start wrapping it up here? All right. Let, let me bring us back into the into the session here. All right. Let let me let me bring the four program back here. <laughs> I'll get their attention eventually. <laughs> I do. Okay. I didn't bring my, my referee's whistle. <laughs> okay. Let, let me bring it back up here. <laughs> so let, let me, let's re, regroup here. So let me let me ask the question. Oh, you started this. I did. <laughs> I'm going to finish it too. <laughs> okay, so let's start with this group over here. Do you guys hire entry level BMETs? Yes, we. Yes, you do. Yes, we do. Or lower. Okay. How about the group in the behind you here? Do you do you guys hire entry level technicians? A lot, a little. More nowadays. More nowadays. How's it going? Okay. Okay. Say say again. Well, since Susan filed that, so I don't go anywhere else. It's nice. So most of our hiring is done. I see. We do find that you know we create replacement positions for those that, uh, and 
you can't get those same positions filled. So you're downgrading as you go. You know, your, your so your senior down. experience people are, are leaving, but you can't replace them with the like for like background. Okay. What about the group in the back? So military training is the entry point? Okay. Okay. And my experience is some of them have medical repair experience and some of them don't. Okay. Mixed, okay. What about the group in the back? Oh, big group. Okay. How about you guys? Kaiser does not. Okay. Um, can you give me a little more rationale of why? What? Okay. So the union structure. So typically unions have an apprenticeship program. Only one person in four years. It's really only been, they have it with a local college in LA and we haven't had anybody for years. But one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Last group. Do you hire entry level? Our company does. We hire most of our technicians we have hired are entry level because we train them internally. Yep. Okay. If they've got any kind of a technical background, you know, ideally we want to hire somebody with a technical background like some electronics or some kind of IT courses, but we hire people who have zero, who just have an aptitude and a desire to lead people. Actually, that's a very important point. Um, personality, if you have someone who says, I'm hungry for this job, I want to learn the skills, you train me and I will master it, trumps everything else. You know, so that attitude um, is so important and you, you should be able to get that during the interview process, hopefully. Okay, so is the juice worth the squeeze? What I mean by that is mentorship programs take work and resources. They don't come for free. You have to create them. You have to design and structure what the program is. And initially there's a negative impact on your productivity. You have someone who is you know, repairing stuff and getting the work orders checked off. And now he's got a junior person who has to explain everything to as he's doing it or she, uh, to the point where productivity um, initially is, is going to suffer. And hospitals are busy, we have a lot to do, and that's not a good thing, at least in the short term. Go ahead, you already comment. Share a story? Please. Okay, so we get a new <laughs> And one of the first things, we're an independent service organization. So we're billing our customers. So one of the first things we assign to a newbie is to work on oxygen concentrators. So one, I'm going through the invoices and I'm going, wait a second, we can't charge somebody $600 to fix an oxygen concentrator because it was taking them three hours to do 30 minutes worth of work. So I had to make sure the bookkeeper understood. They had to bring that back down because it's somebody who doesn't have the experience yet to do it in 30 minutes. So I just point that out that as an independent service organization, we don't want to alienate our customers by charging them way too much money. <laughs> okay, so that's part of this creation and implementation. Negative impact on productivity. Yes. Um, a successful outcome is not always assured. You can get someone who looks good on paper, maybe interviews well, and then you get them on the job and you find they have some other personality traits that you weren't so enamored with. I'm sure there's some stories in the room about that. We all, if, if you've ever hired or fired someone um, and been in a supervisory role, you know what I'm talking about. And the other part is you need a champion. Um, typically director level or above who is interested in solving this problem. Because if you don't have that support, it's not going to happen. And it, it certainly um, 
the chances of success are greatly reduced. Very important to figure that out in your staff that who would be good to help the newbie. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what you need. You need somebody that says, I'll, I'll work with, uh, you know what I mean? So you should always check in your staff who is willing to work. Because there's other people that says, I don't want to mess with this, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's kind of the point. No, I think that that's right, is, is that whoever's in the mentorship role needs to have the mindset and the attitude of, okay, here's a junior person. They're going to take longer. They're going to make mistakes. They're not going to do it the right way the first time. And you can't get frustrated and all upset with with that as to the, the parameters. Okay. So why does this uh, make sense? So basically, you want to look inside your organization before you look outside for growth and promotion. Um, you can find a template and create or create a clearly defined uh, program. And if it works out, it's a win-win because you've taken someone who is eager to work, you've given them skills, experience, and training, and hopefully they're now a productive employee and getting the work done. And then there's you know the the details of how you go about uh, Im implementing that. Um, advanced degrees as I said earlier, are a way of um, knocking down barriers for interviews, for, for looking at taking on new responsibilities or hires. And certification is a similar um, badge that says, yeah, I've gone through a formal review program. Someone's looked at my academic preparation, my experience. There may be a um, oral or, or written test that establishes minimum competency. Doesn't always assure it, but it's usually, you know, it, there's a high correlation. Any questions about this? Okay, so I've done some pros and cons of doing an internship program. So in the plus column, it's a path to add new staff. So the acculturation, that is doing it the way your institution does it is part of the process and it's built in. You don't have to bring in a new hire who goes, well, that's not how we did it at the old place that I worked, or this is the way I've always done it. Um, it's got to be you know, formatted to your institution and this is a good way to get that. You can also reduce the entry level tasks. Um, there are some folks who like doing bench repair work and they'll do it all day, every day, and they just, they're comfortable with it. They don't want to expand and take on the high-end, high-tech, um, high-risk stuff. And there's a place for that. And this, this might be a good way to bring in the, the new, new person. It also builds trust for existing as well as new staff. So if your current uh, department sees that there is a career growth path and that you're interested in developing people, skills and experience, technical schools and training, this is a good way to do it. And, and you can make it formal. You can write down a plan for how you do it in, in your department. So this is not a handout, it's a hand up. It's like, here, let me show you the path. This is a way that you are going to grow in your career. It shortens the timeline to productive staff uh, status. That is um, someone who goes through a mentorship program is working with a senior person. And just being in the room looking over their shoulder, you learn a lot. And, and you avoid some of the serious mistakes or pitfalls. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a training program. And this, this one is also, um, I, I put it on here because it is important. If you bring someone in at, in a program like this, it's a defined period of time. You know, maybe a three-month mentorship or six months, whatever it is. 
You don't have to fire them. You don't have, you can just say, yeah, sorry, it didn't work out. Yeah. You know, this is the analogy of quiet quitting. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we wish you luck. <laughs> and uh, it makes it easy to have someone wash out if, if that's appropriate. On the other side, we've already talked about this. There's a reduction in efficiency. You're spending time with people that could be doing the work who are now doing training. Takes the focus off operations. You know, I, I'm scheduled to meet with Mary on Monday mornings for two hours to go through the mentorship, uh, you know, assignments. And the, for those two hours, I'm not doing the stuff that I normally would be. You have to develop the goals and objectives, implement that is you have to design and create your program. There may be a lack of familiar and common uh, in, in the field. So um, you might be getting someone who has technical skills, maybe working in an automotive um, repair or laboratory repair setting that you want to bring in to work on medical equipment. So there's a bit of a gap that you have to address. And then you have to have engagement from leadership because it, it takes an okay from someone higher up in the food chain to make this go. Okay, next activity. Take a few minutes to discuss pros and cons of creating a program in a small group. We can use the same groups just to be efficient. And then state back your, your preference and rationale for your decisions. So again, this is a, about a five minute discussion. Come on in. So you sold by saying Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I did. <laughs> All right, let's let's bring it back here. <laughs> Goodness, not sure what that was, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. All right, so I I gave you some of my pro and cons, but I want to hear back from your group what what it is that you think are the advantages or the negative parts of of doing a, a mentorship. Again, we'll start with the group here in the front. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, in, uh, the rationale for decisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. No, no, no. I don't want to say. If, uh, <laughs> no, I wanted to you say. Have you have to compare with the first question and the second. I was hired 15 years ago out of college, a okay. something degree in biomedical in LA. Okay. In a very prosperous hospital where I was so proud of UCLA medical. Center. I've heard of UCLA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was very proud, very happy. I was young and I said, okay, I will do my career here. But 15 years later, my career is there is no opportunity for promotion. Ah, okay. So promotion, that career career path. It's promotion because in our department we see I was the only a period of time I was the only female between twenty two guys. And it seems I don't I don't see sex related uh, abilities to do well, or she wanted to go to radiology no, school. To go she to wanted to go. I want so we don't need see they, every time she said, Well, let me go get the training on this or get training uh, on that. So mentoring also means taking care of your senior people. Okay, so you're, you're right, in, and also I'll disagree, that mentoring, or let me put it a different way. I gave a talk in Sacramento at CMIA two weeks ago on career path development. 
we're all responsible for our own career path. And if your current job is limiting and doesn't offer you the opportunities. The thing about UCLA is that it's large enough to have other tangentially related things that are not specifically biomed. And you could talk about risk management, you can talk about database management, you can talk about uh, TJC readiness audits. Yeah, yeah, that's All of these are things that are within HTM Biomed, but are not what you're doing today. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> well, I know it's a sidebar, but to be able to say. Right? Sorry, do recalls, yes. <laughs> um, I did find the handouts that I picked up two weeks ago at Amy. I, these are the only copies I have. Let me circulate them, but I'd like them back at the end of the session. Okay, uh, next group. So, I mean, we're, we're pretty much on the same line as you uh, when it comes to pros and cons. Pro is, is that, of course, you have another set of hands with another body there to assist. Uh, the con is now you have to train that body and you have to invest some time in that person. So, um, and you just don't know what the outcome is going to be. The other pro is, sorry, yeah. no, go ahead. The other pro is the person that's doing the mentoring also learns from the process. That's true. The, the mentor can also gain experience gets better at how the training, teaching, may be able to write policy and procedures or uh, outlines for how the workflow progresses. Um, that's of value as well. Well, and the other thing from uh, the mentor benefit is if the organization sees the person as someone who's developing others, it could be good for that person. So the mentor developing Junior level people is viewed as valuable and upwardly promotable, perhaps, for the mentor, for the mentor as well as the mentee. Yeah, because those are a lot of things that good manager has to do. Okay. How about this group? Comments? Uh, I think one of the uh, disadvantages that's uh, what we talked about a little bit was it's hard to give uh, an intern who's not there for very long. Uh, like a wide view of everything that's going on in the organization. The internship program is limited in its scope and time, therefore yeah. you, it's not a full survey of everything that you do and, and could be done. And that, also, it, um, there's not buy-in in the organization, and it just kind of ends up being like, you know, follow this person around for a little bit until they pitch you somewhere. <laughs> 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 so there needs to be some structure, there needs to be some responsibility, as well as checking in on progress as to what's working and what isn't. And that's part of the structure that needs to be behind a, a, a program like this. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. How about in the back? You were with him, okay. This group. Well, kind of didn't really get to finish, but <laughs> along the same lines of you know, the pros and cons, but we did also, we didn't really get to uh, whether we should or shouldn't have an internship. In some cases, it's great, in other cases, not, because you do have to invest time. Well, let me, let me explore, explore that. So when you say it's not great, it doesn't serve a need or, or it, there's Sorry. no value? It, it might um, be a washout kind of deal, where you'll have somebody who comes in and think things are going great, and then for some odd reason it just did not work out, and now you just had a senior person who took the time to train someone who ultimately didn't end up Get into it. That's possible. So, so there is a little bit of an element of a gamble that it might not be successful, but the consequence of not doing it is you don't have candidates to hire and promote. So, which one of those is the bigger evil? Uh, some, some, if you have a failed, uh, intern that doesn't make it. Uh, that, that gives your senior person a chance to learn too and learn their skills. Not that they did anything wrong, but a chance to get out there and do something different. Um, will they allow you to do it again if the first one fails? If, they, if the first one doesn't turn out to be somebody you can employ, will they say, did, 
was it disruptive, so disruptive that we shouldn't do it again? You always got to make sure upper management doesn't see the details, you know. You know so that could be, but, but that's kind of a, a management type of uh, reinforcing our own staff mm -hmm. and kind of adding them back on those shoulders too and lifting up our staff. And I would like to think that most of the hospital organizations are broad enough that if this candidate doesn't succeed in the first opportunity, maybe there's something tangentially related that they will succeed in and find, you know, joy, happiness, contentment, and productivity. Yes, I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. No, I was going to ask, like, when you're doing this, are you doing only one candidate at a time? So like ours, actually I've got two different kind of program things. So we've got like a high school one where I've got a couple kids come in and then the next week starts the college one where they're coming straight from the community college from the actual doing the biomedical so, program. So the question is how many interns, uh, is it just a single person or is it a group or multiples? It really depends on um, what are your resources, what are your goals and objectives? And you know when you create, the, you know, this is the creative part. Maybe you only have bandwidth to do one at a time, and that's a you know physical space. Uh, that's a way to start. Um, if you're a larger institution, um, UCLA can probably handle a larger group, for example. Okay. But they don't like uh, internship program. This is not the, I mean, this is like a, they don't do internship. I know. They hiring people with. Uh, experience in a low-level job. Well, and, I mean, Kaiser, another you know, massive organization, doesn't do this either. So you're in good company. <laughs> anyway, there was a question. To the point that sometimes interns are doing apprentices and interns don't work out, I've hired enough technicians with plenty of years of experience that they had to go. <laughs> they didn't fit into the team. Screen them on an interview, and sometimes they get in and they get through that that first interim period, and then they change. So let me repeat: the the comment is for the washouts that have been given an opportunity, but they just are not the right fit. Is it because their technical competency wasn't there? Were they not dedicated to show up on time reliably? Was it that their interest was in something else from what they thought? Did they not get a realistic job preview of what the duties, responsibilities, and tasks? No of... human compatibility. Oh, I, there, there is a. We there... had the head of the nursery call us and say, "This guy that's in here right now, I don't ever want to see him in my nursery again." He just told the nurse to have the baby removed out of the incubator so he could safety check it. He had no human. I don't want to hear about the nine months of pain. I show me the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's also something called the Ninja Biomed. You may have heard of this. He comes in, in the middle of the night, never talks to anyone. No one knows that he's been there. He fixes stuff and he disappears into the night. Surgery is completed by 7 a.m. <laughs> um, my view is you want to be the face of Biomed. You are the person who shows up that gets things done, solves problems, and is a recognizable and trustable resource. And you build a relationship around that um, will take you a lot farther than just coming in the back door and disappearing quietly without saying anything to anybody. Pers personal uh, preference. Um, this group over here. Richard seemed to have a mentorship program that's mature, whereas I'm starting one. So well, trade cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so stay in touch. And he, and he's an ISO, we're an ISO. Okay. But uh, the biggest con that I see, because I'm the one standing up the program, is it's incredibly labor intensive. And I'm kind of learning as I go, because I'm not a bio. So, okay. So, I mean, I've got, con I've got, you know, content people that's taken care of, but still. It's, it's more labor intensive than I thought it was going to be. So the, the scope of, of organizing the program is large. Yeah. Are there any existing programs or people who have mentorship programs that you can well, learn yeah, from? That's what we do in our company, Renewing Biomedical, is the first company to partner with Amy in the Department of Labor to do that. So we're nearly two years into that doing the aiming. Yeah. Biomedical and we're just getting started with that. Okay. So it, it 
was a lot of work in the beginning, but I'm currently uh, teaching my fifth group of people so that we get hired. And put the well, I, I'm just handing around some of the flyers for that describe the Amy program. Amy also has a blog area. Start a thread on mentorship. And How many people uh, did you retain as employees? We have retained. Uh, we have only have had 18 people that have gone through the training. We have lost one of them, and they went to back to the company that their father works at in another city. Nepotism. So, so you would you would have lost them anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. Lost, <laughs> the rest of us is that they were transferred to Hilton Head, South Carolina, which I couldn't blame them for moving with my <laughs> Hilton Head. But then. Uh, they got divorced this summer and he came back. <laughs> <laughs> that's impressive. That, that's a, a surprise ending. <laughs> and we're in a very small city, uh, which is complete Memphis and Nashville. So we don't have a lot of competition. And when we train them, they are appreciative of the job that they have. If they want to get out and do something else, we got plenty of field service work we can send them out to do. So they don't have to stay there in Jackson, Tennessee, which I wouldn't blame them for anybody who wants to get out of there. I'm not from there. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had very, very, very successful retaining people. Yes. One, one other. Well, I think that's another pro that everybody can take away from this is the organization that you belong to. You don't have to do this alone. We're a community. A clinical engineering and STEM community out there. I've had the last two BMEDs of the year, BMED 2021 and 22, Maggie Berkey and Lee Chamberlain to name. So there's no reason why we can't tap into their resources out there besides internally. If you're a large organization, you got a large community family, tap into those resources, network, get out there. So and help you. Let, let me repeat that there's a community within Biomed yeah. HTM. And so reach out to your community. I only have a couple more slides and we're getting close to the end of the uh, session. So here's um, a piece about the Amy uh, mentorship program and how they've structured it. They have these materials. So uh, take a look at the flyers going around, look at their website. You can find more information about how they suggest you do it. Um, here's the benefit risk of trained versus untrained uh, people doing the job. You know, you improve efficiency, they get more done in a, a work session, the consistency of the work is better. Your employee satisfaction, if you train people so they know what to do and are recognized for getting the job done the way that it's expected, you know, it's a win-win. And you also have improved patient satisfaction. So um, here are some, you know, dichotomies in terms of, you know, where you can go with your career. You can either follow a technical role or if you want to, you know, and there's um, room for people who are super expert on a nurse call system, on a CT scanner. Um, there's all these uh, high tech systems that we have in our world of, of medical devices. Um, but you can also have some people who want to go up the management track, start supervising. Um, become a, a director um, or or above. Um, there are folks who like coming to work and they, it, no day is is the same as the last. You never know what the you know device is that's going to be the one that needs your attention. Other people like that bench roll where it, it's an eight to five. It's predictable. It's stable. They don't have to you know think as hard, but maybe that's what they like to do. Um, some people are more extroverted, and uh, I gave away my definition of an extroverted engineer. He stares at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's compensation. Um, I mean, I earlier in my career, I worked at some startups, and uh, they're high risk, but you know, you can also get paid well. Um, there are some people who were satisfied getting the same paycheck it's a predictable um you know growth advancement path and they're they're fine with that 
Okay, um, let's talk about the spectrum of job roles. And I, I just want to do this quickly around the room because we're running out of time of what are the certain, the, the subspecialty areas that are still within Biomed HTM? Just shout one out. Network specialist. Network specialist. Imaging engineer or imaging specialist? I said cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. Why would we need that? Laboratory. Laboratory. Anesthesia. Okay, I'm going to give you my list. These are all things that biomed departments may or may not do or do more or less, but they're all some some a title, job title or role that is needed and represented in HTM. And they're, by the way, the slide presentation, I understand they're gonna make these available afterwards so you don't have to take notes or write those down. Depends on the organization, that's one person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're working in a um, 80 bed community hospital out in Podunk, you may do, be doing all of this. Very true. Okay. So here's a um, a slide that I picked up from my organization on how to do mentoring, and this one is interesting because it start, starts top down. It's looking for directors and above who are willing to do mentoring for more junior folks, rather than the other way around. I think in, in this group, it's probably trying to figure out how to do it bottom up. But anyway, so there is a, uh, a, a at least an attentive ear and um, management, senior management at Stanford is interested in this. So here's the concluding slide. Think outside the box, be creative, figure out what you can do. Don't spend a whole lot of time about the barriers and what I can't do and I don't have the resources or the, uh, the what it fill in the blank, okay? Be positive about this. Grow your own staff. It sends the right message that we value you for what you're contributing today. And if you get more experience, training, or have a desire to do something else, you can actually grow into a position of more responsibility, perhaps a better compensation, or maybe it's something that you just really have a passion that you want to, to do that is, I've been doing this for the last two and a half years, it's time to move on to do something, something that's um, different. And that's okay. Okay. Um, one solution is not to be expected. So you gotta try different things. If you do an internship or a mentorship and it doesn't work the first time, that doesn't mean that the mentorship program is a bad concept. Maybe it was that particular individual or maybe you didn't create the structure in a way that allowed it to progress to a positive outcome, but keep at it. And you need to have the, the resources and support. If your director or senior, you know, C-level doesn't believe in this, it's not going anywhere. So you do need to have that infrastructure planned out. And then the last comment is use metrics. If you measured what it was before you started and then what it is after you implement it and you can identify that you're getting more work done, it's easier to sell. Okay, we have a couple of minutes for Q&A. So, any questions for me? Um, so, if you were a young professional and you were in an organization that didn't have a form of mentoring, how, how might you go about finding a mentor? Great question. So, the question is, if you are a uh, entry-level um, employee and there's no structured mentorship program, how would you create one or find one? Find a mentor. Find a mentor. Um, there's no set formula for how you find mentors. Now, typically there's someone who works in the shop, who's been there a while, is respected because when you get stuck, when you ask the question, Bob or whoever it is knows the answer or at least knows where to go. Um, 
there's no clear right or wrong answer to where mentors come from. So they, they tend to be sort of self-apparent once you've been in the system a, lo a while. But um, you can also seek them out and say, uh, I'm new. Who do you know that I can work alongside to get these job skills and, and training? So be vocal. Don't be shy. Ask for what you need. 